All right, guys, I was able to pull a few strings with a nice lady inside there named Angela who agreed to take me on top of the on-site disposal facility. I'm actually looking forward to this. I think it's going to be pretty sweet. It's like 65 feet tall, so the view up there is going to be awesome. And I think I hear her now coming out, and I'm going to follow her up, and we're going to take a look standing on top of the world or more appropriately standing on top of a pile of radioactive debris following Angela up to the facility we are on the approach to the site disposal facility Here we are getting let in. As you get right up to the gate, you can see right here no trespassing sign. Thankfully, I'm with Angela, so I won't be in any trouble today. So these buildings up here, these are pump houses? And these are the valve houses. The valve houses? Eight, eight at the base of the on-site disposal facility. And each of the individual cells will pack up some debris that are completely enclosed on the site. Each cell has its own valve house. Okay. Each cell has its own set of leachate pipes in the liners, which funnel out any water that may still be contained in the debris and the valve houses pump it over to the water treatment facility. Let's see it off there Stay in the distance. Mm -hmm. And is it true that a couple of these cells are pretty much bone dry now? Yes, when they started putting the debris in, they didn't fill all eight cells at the same time. So cells, the number one cell is at the north end of it, of the structure, and they filled it from the top from the north all the way down to the southern end. Right. So the first two cells, I believe, the hydrologists have told us are now classified as dry because they're not producing really any appreciable leachate at all. The remaining six cells, uh, I believe the hydrologist said together, total, those remaining six cells are producing about a thousand gallons of leachate a week which is down markedly from what it was in the beginning. Okay. So they're slowly, each cell will slowly progressively dry out, which is exactly what they're intended to do. Right. So. Here's the metal bridge, that's the way up. Keep it safe so we don't stumble over the boulders. It's nice and mowed, we got a nice little path to, it is. to walk up, <laughs> thankfully. That our bridge is growing up a little bit, but I've come up here early in the morning before and gotten halfway up and had a doe jump up and, and snort and run off. So oh, wow. <laughs> I'll see you'll see back here. That's the visitor center directly opposite us. And from here back to the center, it's just about a mile straight across. Okay. Normally, in the fall of the winter, these ponds back here are covered with waterfowl. Because all this former production area either has equipment in it that is assisting with the groundwater remediation, or it's just staff access only. So it's kind of like a mini preserve in the preserve, where the wildlife can really not have any human pressure on them at all. So. And a lot of these ponds scattered throughout the property, were they former foundations of yeah, buildings? Yeah, anywhere out here you see a open water habitat. That's where they dug out under the foundations of former production buildings or support buildings. Or on the far side, where some of the waste pits were. Okay. So all of that is open water habitat now. Where they only had to take out a little bit of the soil, then that is kind of like marshy grassland. So, And all of this grassy areas, reseeded Ohio um, native prairie plants. 
which really thrive in that disturbed uh, soil. Uh, we're only now just starting to get some trees coming in there, which is great. That means the grasses have done their job of breaking up the soil and adding nutrients back to it. So I would love to dig a time machine forward about a hundred years and see how far the forest has encroached down into the grassy areas, how much they'll let it. Um, that would be really nice. Everything to the north to the tree line, south to almost that gravel road we came in on, and from the base of the on-site disposal facility over to the visitor center, all of that was production buildings. So production plants and support buildings, the power plant, water plant. Just gives you an idea of how massive in scale this facility was. So this thing is three quarters of a mile long? Three quarters of a mile long, and from the base of the ground across the top and down the back side of the base, it's 800 feet. Okay. I think it's got a footprint of about 100 acres, if I'm remembering correctly. So it definitely is a massive structure. So what was this spot when it was the feed materials plant? Because like on the overhead maps, it looks like it was almost in this shape originally. It was, there were a couple of access roads. Uh, the access road that goes around the um, east edge and hooks up with the north gate, that road used to be the main entrance into the site. The south entrance that we come in now, that was built later on in production. Um, but that original road basically was as it was. On the north end here, um, as you go out on the Hickory Trail, right before you get to the fork where you can go left or right and do the loop, mm -hmm. you'll notice on your left there's like a wide, almost as wide as this, flat, straight line of prairie grassland. That's the remains of the old railroad bed that was built from Patty's Run Creek into the site. And that was used, I think I mentioned, to bring materials in and to take the finished products out. Okay. So on the north end, where that goes across what is now the Hickory Trail, used to be the rail yard where the cars would be staged uh, to add product to them, the empty cars would be staged and then they'd go back out. Other than this, this was part of the buffer zone around that central 200 acres or so where the buildings were. All of these sites had their production facilities condensed in the center of the properties that, that were annexed and then they had a massive buffer zone around the outside. Okay. So this was originally flat and part of that buffer zone and okay. in fact where we are at the base of this, where we walked in, it used to be where the gravel road is now. Mm -hmm. That level all the way out to Willie Road. So the reason the Lodge Pond Bowl is where it's at, and we have that little little mini valley right there, is because that was where the clean topsoil was taken to form the top soil cap layer on here that was then seeded with the grasses. Okay. So that's why the lodge pond. That's is why there, it's like that's that. Okay. No doubt. That was there was no structure there. That was all clean area in the buffer zone. But that pond is there now, and that little bowl, mini valley right there is there now because of the the topsoil that was lifted off to form this structure. And then the fields right behind us here, that's part of the Nolman farm still. I didn't know there was a crude oil pipeline that ran through here too. Yes, you can just see the edge of the, uh, along the eastern edge of the property, there's some, on the upper leg of the uh, Lodge Pond Trail, there's a couple of markers that indicate that runs just along the edge of the property. Now was that here during the feed material days or was that, was that put in after? You know, I would have to look that up. Um, if I had to guess, well, I don't want to guess because I want to research that before I right. see. I truly don't know. <laughs> um, I really need to take a look into that because okay. people do ask about it.
So this is what is covering the entire structure out of Northern Spring. Is and that, that riprap rock? And that's the sister site. Yeah, that's that's the sister site. Their mission Fernald? was the same as Fernald's mission during production. Um, and again, that redundancy was built in in case one site was unable to fulfill their mission, the other one could continue producing product for the weapons complex.